Mention ground nesting bees, and most people immediately think of yellow jackets, which are actually wasps and far different from our native ground nesting bee species. On an episode of the Backyard Ecology podcast, Shannon had a chance to talk with Dr. Jordan Kuhneman from the Danforth Entomology Laboratory about our native ground nesting bees, how they differ from their cousins of the yellow jackets, and even differ from the perception of what bees are to most people. Here is what they had to say about our fascinating ground nesting bees. So to get started, can you just give us a short overview about what we mean by the term ground nesting bees? Sure. Well, it is just like it sounds. So we're talking about bees that make their nest in the soil. And primarily we're talking about solitary bees. So individual females that make a burrow and tumulus down into the ground and then provision the future of their species, the next generation underground. And just to be clear, because this is a concern that I hear from a lot of people when I talk to them about ground nesting bees, I'm sure you get it too. We're not talking about yellow jackets here. Right. We're not talking about yellow jackets here. And we're not usually talking about social bees. I mean, that's sort of a big shift in people's perspective of bees is that most bees are solitary and they nest individually. And most bees nest in the ground. So that means it's one female doing all the work, really. She's building the nest. And she's uh, gathering all the resources for her offspring. So yeah, single mother, hard at work. Yes. You might have a lot of them in one location, but the way I often describe it is that's your neighborhood. That's your subdivision. Yeah. We refer to those as bee aggregations. Um, and that's primarily what I'm working on and what I'm fascinated in, in is how do these bees form aggregations? Where do they form them and why? And how do you get them to persist in the environment? But that's correct. You've got lots of individual bees making nests in the same location. So obviously they like that spot for a reason. They are extremely fun to watch when you see them. They're mesmerizing, aren't they? Like you, you can be a part of their world because all these bees are very gentle and they don't really care that you're there. And so you can just be as close as you want and observe them going about their business in a way that I never thought possible, um, you know, for bees. Yeah, because we always think of bees, we think of honeybees, where you've got those huge hives, they've got a lot of resources to defend, and they will defend them. Yeah. Obviously, anybody would. Um, so it makes sense that the bees would too. But this is a very, very different situation with these solitary ground nest bees. Entirely different. They're going about their own business. There isn't this urge to defend, you know, they're more worried about getting to their, their nest and back out to forage again so that they can create a new chamber for another bee and they try to maximize their time that way. They don't even really defend against the other bee parasites or other parasites that are in their environment. I mean, they might a little, like if they recognize them, but they're often too distracted and don't seem to really uh, care that much about um, parasites that are taking advantage of their hard work. Yeah, let's come back to that because sure. that's something that people don't, think about a whole lot are right. parasites of bees. I mean, it's just not even something that you think about. Yeah, well, I mean, you have to observe these aggregations and people don't know really how present they are in the environment. It's, it's sort of an open question, right? We're trying our best at this moment and in this work that we're doing with Project Ground Nesting Bee to map these aggregations and then follow them through time using community scientists to give us information as to what's the size of this aggregation? Who's there? Um, what does it look like from year to year? What are the attributes of that environment that they're nesting in that make that so important to them? Right. Because we assume that we know most things about the environment and especially the common things that we might find anywhere. Right. And we don't. There's a lot of things that we don't know. I feel like that's just typical of entomology in general, there's so much we don't know. I mean, there's, yeah, overlooked species, understanding their distributions, their relationships is largely unknown, surprisingly. Yeah. As you don't know what you don't know. And then once you start learning what you don't know, it's like, oh my gosh, I know nothing. Uh, we know nothing. Well, that's why I, I like this project so much because it gives people the opportunity to have a personal experience with bees in a way that they couldn't before in the same way that I did when I came to the realization, wow, this is very important. I want to get out there. I want to learn more about these bees because you can 
visit these aggregation sites um, and they're going to be there year after year if they're maintained in a safe way. And you can just go experience them. You know where they're going to be. You know when they're going to be. And once you learn where they are in the environment, there's different species to observe. There's interesting biology in your backyard that you haven't yet experienced. There's like 70% of our native bees are ground nesters. That's correct. And in the U.S., we have around 4,000 species of native bees and 20,000 worldwide. So that's a lot of species that are going under the radar that are not really top of mind for folks when they're thinking about bees, but also are really included in our discussions about how we should be managing the environment. How do we create sustainable ecosystems and uh, maintain pollinators and diverse pollinators in our environment? So that's part of this is figuring out where these amazing sites are that support the birth of our native bees and how do we maintain those in the environment? Exactly. And you said 4,000 in the U.S. Do some parts of the U.S. have more ground nesting bee species than other parts or how does yeah. that kind of play out or do we know? Well, we don't know all the details there, but certainly there are areas that are more diverse than others. And there are environment types that seem to favor ground nesting over others. Um, and we're starting to learn where these large aggregations are more likely to be found. So that's part of the goal. Where do we find the diversity of ground nesting bees? Where do we find these amazing sites that support, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands into the millions of bees? I mean, there are some places out there that are acres of ground nesting bees. And we don't know how long they've been there. We don't know how many bees are there, but it's in the many millions. And so that's just a tremendous resource in the landscape. It's a tremendous biological event that occurs every year. It would be wonderful to learn more about this across the landscape and to get people engaged in understanding their biology, reporting on where they are, and then protecting them in the landscape. And can you give us some ideas of just generally like what types of areas do they like the most? Where do you find the most diversity? Some of that, what we know about it or think we know. Yeah, that's, that's to be, you know, determined really. I mean, where we see them the most and where we get these very large aggregations are in, often in South facing mowed lawns, cemeteries, uh, places where there's been management that's been consistent over a long time. But that has a lot to do with certain types of bees that are able, that are willing to form these large aggregations. That has to do with our ability to find them. So sometimes they're in the forest or they're in areas that had been flooded previously. And so sometimes we wouldn't come across those, but that's what we're trying to figure out. I mean, this project is about locating large aggregations and determining, you know, why bees nest where they do, but it's also uh, wants to capture the more rare species and species that are individually nesting that aren't in aggregations and get a sense of where they nest. Then those are big open questions as to where they nest and why. I know on our property, we've got an area that we, I find them in every March, early March, late February, yeah. early March. It's a north facing slope, sort of sandy clay soil. It's a loamy clay with some sand mixed in. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it's on an old roadbed, tractor roadbed, actually, um, wow. within a forested area. And they are out for a week, maybe two weeks, usually more closer to a week. I mean, if you don't see them and go out and photograph them and enjoy them, then it's done. I mean, yeah. you'll see nothing afterwards. Amazing. But yeah. So we get that every year. Girl, and, was it, was it because of the soil type? Was it because of the soil type and it was compressed uh, by a tractor at some point? Like what in the history of that site led to it being an ideal place for bees to then continue to come back to and reproduce in year after year? I mean, those are, those are some of the outstanding questions. That's what we're trying to figure out. How do we, how do we learn what they want and maybe how do we make sure we include it in our landscapes? Yes. So one of the things that I've always been kind of curious with are bees is what species are they? Because like you said, there's lots of different species here. Yeah. And so do you have tips for how to go about identifying them that like a normal person could do without having to try and catch them and stuff like that? Just look at, or can you? Yeah. Well, I mean, often people want to immediately jump to what is this bee species? And largely that takes a taxonomic expert with a microscope. Um, but 
move up. You know, you can start with what is the, what is the family of bees? Like bees are so diverse, so that's a good place to start. Like, where's the bee carrying its pollen? You know, what are some of the other physical attributes of this bee? And then once you kind of learn some general traits of the family level, you can say, okay, what are the more prevalent genera of this bee? And what are some of those attributes? And so you kind of need to start a little bit higher and move yourself to a point of understanding uh, what bee you're looking at. And so it's a bit tricky, but one place that we encourage you to start, especially if you're observing a ground nesting bee, is to add it onto our INAP project. That's the goal is to help figure out where these bees are nesting and who they are. And so then we and many experts and people engaged in the INAP community can provide some taxonomic resolution there. And if it's a bee that we think, oh, this is very important, let's figure out more about it, then we can work directly with you um, to try to understand your aggregation in more depth. But certainly there are resources by state, right? I mean, people have broken this down, um, extension, uh, office, you know, people in your state uh, often will have guides. Um, there are some general books, you know, common bees of the Northeast or common bees of the West. Like there are places to kind of get just your foot in the door, but obviously it's, um, it's a bit involved. Yes. I've looked at some of the books and, and the field guides and stuff. And I'm like, I don't know, I'm not getting something with it. It's like, okay, it's a ground nesting bee. I mean, there's some that as like, oh yeah, I know that one. Uh, bicolored sweat bee. That right. one's the bright green. It's got the white stripes. It's like, okay, I can get that one. But then, but you could take that and be like, oh, it's metallic. You know, oh, it has to say, oh, maybe it's more likely a helictive and then go more directly there. So there are these traits um, that if you learn a little bit about these higher levels of bees, you're like, oh, okay, I know where to start looking in more detail. It sounds like it's like birds and like with plants and everything else. You, you start with one place and keep going down. And look at what they're doing and where they're doing it, right? I mean, the fact that they're nesting in the ground, you know, often people are unaware that there's these whole behavior types of bees that are generally have the taxonomic link, right? Like whether they're nesting in reeds or stems or, you know, carving out a hole in some dead wood, you know, those are uh, traits for different groups of bees. Our native ground nesting bees are just some of the native bee species you can provide for on your property. In fact, if you already have native plants growing in your yard, it is likely there are many species of native bees already visiting it. If you want to learn more about the bees in your yard, I highly recommend the book Bees, an Identification and Native Plant Forage Guide by Heather Holm. This book covers native bees and introduced species in detail, including size, when they are active, life cycle, where they nest, and how they collect pollen, and even has a section covering common native forage plants for each bee. There are sections devoted to many species of native trees, shrubs, and herbaceous plants that bees use. I will put a link to it in the description. This is an affiliate link, which simply means we get a commission if you purchase the book. No extra cost to you. We simply get a small commission from the seller, which helps support the channel. If you would like to learn more about the fascinating world of ground nesting bees, you can see the rest of the podcast conversation in this video, and be sure to take some time and enjoy nature in your backyard.